I'm with Catherine Perez Shakadam, the executive director of We Believe in Israel. Now, Catherine, what is We Believe in Israel? So We Believe in Israel is a leading advocacy group here in the UK. And our main goal is to basically promote Israel as a sovereign state that it is. And to impress on people that we, Israel as a sovereign nation, has every right to self-defend, but also to live peacefully within its borders. And that Israel is perfectly happy engaging with its neighbors on the basis that its integrity, the safety of its people, cannot be challenged. And we certainly oppose any call for genocide or accusation, for example, it's not like we're running away from accusation of wrongdoing. It's we don't like when those accusations are unfounded and leveled at Israel on the basis of anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, which unfortunately is pretty much holding the narrative right now. And so we're trying to recenter conversation towards peaceful resolution. We're trying to have people engage on the basis of truth, facts and data and to dispel lies whenever we can. And something that is very important to us also is that Israel is often painted as a country that is in a state of apartheid. It actually practices apartheid, which is not true. What we're trying to do is to actually demonstrate that Israel is a multicultural society, that freedom of religion is a real right that is protected under the law, and that many great communities are living in Israel perfectly peacefully, that there's a great harmony, if only people were not paying it to the, the narrative of, of radicals. And, you know, whatever they may be, whoever they may be, it's not so much, you know, we're not just concentrating on Islamic radicalism, for example, but any form of radicalism is dangerous for any given democratic society. So this is what we're trying to fight for. We're trying to fight for those values that we do hold dear in the UK, and the very values that we feel Israel is implementing, holding, and embodying. Is today anti-Zionism the new anti-Semitism? Yes, I do. I really feel like this. I feel there's been a shift where, you know, anti-Semitism is not too fashionable, at least, you know, on the on the back of World War II. It was something that was quite taboo and people were trying to run away from any accusation of And so I believe that you saw the birth in the Middle East, and by that I mean specifically the Islamic Republic of Iran, of a new narrative. It's a repackaging of old, you know, blood libel and old hatred to make it trendier and to also give it a veneer of, you know, being politically correct in that, you know, they keep telling you, oh, we're not criticizing the Jews per se, we're just criticizing the state of Israel. And with that, every Jew on the face of the earth, because if you listen to the language that is being used and you start digging and actually asking real questions, then you discover that actually the the accusation or the hate is actually leveled at Jews altogether. And this is something that is quite disturbing because, again, I think it's important in order for people to address hate, to give it its proper name. And anti-Zionism, I think, is quite... It's, uh, it's quite insidious in that, again, it's trying to present itself as something that it is not, when in fact it's a repackaging of anti-Semitism. And I think that people need to face up to it and understand that Zionism is not a bad word. Zionism, you know, is the affirmation for Jews to have a home, to have a nation to call their own. And that nation happens to be Israel. It's our ancestral home. It's our heritage. It's a reality under international law. And so to call you know, Zionism, the expression of fascism is is unfair, it's unfounded, and it's profoundly racist. And so something needs to be done. And people tend to forget also that Israel is home to great many people and great many communities, that Jews, of course, live in Israel, but not only. You have Christians, you have Baha'is, you have all kinds of, you know, people, Muslims, Sunni, Shia. It's home for everyone that wants to call it home. And this is something, again, that is being lost in, in the narrative. People don't understand that To say that Israel needs to disappear means that you are condemning millions of people who are not just, you know, not not all of us are Jews in Israel to to death and to, to deny them of an identity that they espouse, that they believe in, that they feel is their own. And I don't think that it is fair to ask people to disappear. Have you been busy in the last year since October the 7th defending Israel? Yes, it's been exhausting, if I'm honest with you. And what really pains me, and it's quite difficult, is that I would like to move away from, you know, the very old conversation, for example, the notion that, oh, you know, Jews love to kill babies, that we are genocidal in nature, that we lie, that we are unreliable. You know, all those things are, again, a, a rebranding of the, the, the old blood libel. And I'd like people to 
to explain to me, but no one has been able to, to explain to me, where does it stem from? Why is it that people hold the belief that Jews are inherently evil? It's just insane. People, I mean, especially in the West, you know, are calling themselves liberal, are calling themselves compassionate, saying that they believe in democracy and in the values, you know, declaration of human rights, all those beautiful sentiments that, you know, I believe in myself. But then when it comes to Jews, you know, the rules are being thrown away. Nothing applies. Women in Israel were attacked, brutalized, raped by Hamas. You know, you had proof. They were there on video. It was well documented. You had testimonies. And yet people, you know, a few years after the Me Too movement and we should believe all women, then suddenly things, you know, became a lot murkier when it came to Jews because then the assumption was that, you know, Jewish women are lying. And so again, I'm wondering why is it that there's, you know, there's a different standard when it comes to the Jews. And again, it's pure racism. And you can't. I choose to believe all women all the time. It doesn't matter where they're from or what they believe. You know, religion is something that is so personal that it should not be taken into account when a woman is speaking of violence that has been done to her. The same thing goes for her ethnicity, her nationality. I mean, it's at the end of the day, it's a human being that is calling out for help that has endured a lot of trauma that deserves to be listened to. And this ability that people have to dismiss Jews on account that they don't like Israel has been exhausting. And we have had to defend ourselves against accusation of genocide, accusation of barbarism, accusation of, you know, that we made up lies, that Israel killed its own people on October 7th so that it could justify the invasion of Gaza, which makes no sense because we could have invaded Gaza without an excuse, really, if that was the intent. That we are committing acts of genocide against Hezbollah, which is a terrorist organization that is proscribed under many, many laws, you know, the US, the UK, France and others. And so, again, the question persists as to why, and we have had to defend ourselves. And what pains me the most within that is that we, we haven't been able to tell the story of Israel about the beautiful stuff that Israel has to contribute to the world. And, you know, no nation, no country, no people is all bad or all good. It's a mix of everything. This is what makes, I think, humanity so interesting and beautiful is that it's imperfect. But to criticize for the sake of calling for genocide or rather to use, you know, criticism to justify calls for genocide, I think is beyond the pale for me. And I want to believe that people will change once they know the truth. And so we're trying very hard. It is difficult to cut through the noise. People don't want to hear from us. The second that, you know, you say the word Jew or Israel, people run away in the other direction, call you bias, tell you that you're a liar because of where you come from and your heritage. It hurts. At least I feel sometimes that we have been abandoned, even though we have been willing very, very often to stand with people, to stand with the underdog, to stand with those who deserved and needed to be defended. And so sometimes I'm asking myself, when is it our turn? When will people stand with us? And I'm not saying that they haven't, but it feels very much like the majority is against us right now. It felt like a media war. And do you receive hate when you're doing what you do? We do. I think, look, with me, it's, it's a bit complicated because uh, a few years back, I have an interesting, I would say, career. In that a few years ago, I i mean, it's a very long story, but um, to make it very short, I infiltrated the Islamic Republic of Iran to gather some information, not because I'm a member of you know any particular intelligence agency. It's just it's something that I felt I wanted to do because I wanted to defend my people. And so I did this. And so the, the regime, when the regime found out, obviously, I wasn't their favorite person. And they have done everything they could to discredit me, to, you know, call me a liar. Unfortunately, there were pictures, so it was difficult to say that I didn't do the, the things that I, I said I did, you know, by their own account too. And so, yes, I've received a lot of, you know, hate mail and things like this, but also because I've never responded to it because I don't want to engage, you know, in that kind of exercise. I don't think it's very healthy. And so I just ignore it. And I think that people get tired of insulting me and never getting a response. So they kind of leave me alone. But, you know, occasionally I receive, you know, the odd, not death threats, but, you know, people are, are saying that, oh, Hitler missed one or two, that, you know, this and that should happen to me. But I usually don't pay heed and then it goes away. But I, I would say I think I'm a lot. I'm the lucky one. A lot of people have received a lot of threats. A lot of people have been, have been bullied into silence and very few have responded because we continue to fight. But it is difficult. It, it gets, you know, it gets to you after a while, this bullying, this uh, gaslighting, this uh, desire to erase you and silence you and our desire to, you know, to be spoken. But no one listens. It's a very difficult spot. But again, I don't want to play the victim because we are not. We will continue to fight. 
because I think that the second that we stop, it means that, you know, everyone else will be left open to the very hatred that we're facing right now. And so I feel that we have the shoulders to carry it and we have to fight for other people too, because when we are not in the line of fire, then someone else will. So we might as well just fight for those people and protect them too. You have on your website, write to your MP. Tell us about that. So we run campaigns. So what we do, when we identify something that we feel, you know, we, we must react to. So for example, we've done something around FIFA, trying to, to buy Israel from the group. We've asked our, our supporters to be writing to, you know, various, you know, entities, including the MPs to try to raise the issue, trying to, to demand accountability, trying to offer solutions when we feel that a dialogue must, you know, must take place and recentering the conversation again around data, because I do believe that, look, MPs are there to do their job. I don't think that the ambition to fail but at the same time, you know, a lot of MPs don't have the data that they need. And so I feel that sometimes they make decisions based on what they think they know. So what we're trying to do through our campaigns and our letters to MP is to educate MPs and, and ask them to engage in a dialogue with us. And also it shows that the, the Jewish community and its partners are willing to, you know, fight the good fight and that they're willing to, to use democratic tools to do that. And I think it's very positive. We've had, we've had several wins. I'm glad to say that we had some lovely responses from MPs where they are willing to talk to us. And that is across the board, you know, whether they are conservative or Labour or whatever else. People, MPs have proven to be quite willing to engage with us, which is good news. And we will continue to do so. It's We call this grassroots mobilisation in that we're trying to encourage people to use their voices because we live in a democracy. We might as well, you know, use and utilise the tools at our disposal and make sure that we make things better for the next generation and for ourselves. You've already mentioned about FIFA. Tell us about that campaign. So that campaign started on the back of efforts from certain actors to to bar Israel by trying to politicize FIFA and making the, the point that, oh, you, you can't possibly have Israel among you. And so you need to just kick them out. And we believe that sports, the very spirit of sports is to actually unite people and to try to, you know, it's a great equalizer. And I don't think that to weaponize sport in that way, to push people out of society or out of a space that should not be politicized, that should not give way to racism or any form of discrimination. I think it's contrary to uh, the very spirit of FIFA. And so we, we engage with its president, we engage with various of its donors trying to impress on them that, you know, it would be a bad turn for the organization to politicize because if you do it to one on the basis of whatever, then who's to say, first of all, who's to decide who's the next, you know, who will be kicked out next and on what basis? It becomes a bit of a slippery slope. So, so far, I would say it's a win because nothing has been decided. So they've they kind of gone quiet, which for me is a win because at least they're not talking about, it, about doing it. So it's something that, you know, for us, it's, it's going in the right direction. Now, I'm hoping that this will not be replicated and that never again is anyone asked to be potentially cast out on the basis of, you know, I don't know, someone else's preferences. You also had a campaign about the Nobel Peace Prize and UNRWA possibly winning. How crazy was that? I know. Well, look, it's, you know, the thing about UNRWA, look, I was glad about the Nobel Peace Prize because I think that was, um, that was a great win. I think, and it was also the reasonable thing to do. Now, the other campaign that we have about UNRWA, so calling on our lovely government here in the UK to withhold funding and not on the basis that we do not want aid to go to Gaza. Of course we do. We have to. People are suffering and we need to, to help them. We need to make sure that they have everything that they need, even though the situation is very complicated. But, you know, civilians and innocent people should not have to bear the brunt of this war. It's unfair. It's unjust. But I would say that blame lies solely at the feet of Hamas. They are a terrorist organization. They are the one putting people into harm's way. They wanted, they architected this conflict, knowing that Israel would do what it needed to do. And they're hiding amongst, you know, the civilian population. So, of course, casualties are, are a reality that I deplore. But at the same time, Israel needs to defend itself. And again, people tend to forget that we still have hostages being held by Hamas. So something needs to be done. So now what we're asking for is for UNRWA to be held accountable. 
for a review to take place and make sure that the funds that are going to UNRWA, the funding that the UK is providing, for example, is not going to replenish the coffer of Hamas and that this aid that is arriving in Gaza is actually being distributed to the right people and not again going to be weaponized by Hamas. Because then it's almost a slap in the face to Palestinians because we're saying we're raising all those millions and billions of dollars to help them, but nothing get to them. And so, you know, the real injustice is again to them. And our goal is to help Palestinians in Gaza and making sure that they, they get what they need, what they deserve. I think it's it's only fair. And that was the purpose of UNRWA. Unfortunately, it's not what's happening. It's been hijacked by Hamas. It's been weaponized by Hamas. And because it's a UN agency, and so many people have so many political interests vested in this, nobody wants to bite the bullet and say, you know, to do a mea culpa and say, oops, you know, we, we missed the mark, we failed, let's restructure, let's reform. They don't want to do this because they don't want to be the one doing the job. It's a very difficult job. And also they don't want to be held accountable because they fear that if they were to admit defeat or at least that mistakes were made, they would somewhat, you know, blame themselves for what was done. But I would say it's it's everyone's fault and no one's fault. It's a system that was not put in place in a way that would truly secure that the aid is being delivered properly to the people of Gaza. And I don't think that you could, you could point to one person and say, well, it's your fault and your fault only. No, it's an institution. And so what they need to understand is that we need to reform so that it doesn't happen again. It doesn't matter what happened in the past. It's gone. It's over. We can't fix it. But we, we could fix tomorrow. That's what we're calling for, to fix tomorrow. Are you getting stories out from October the 7th? We have. So the, the problem that we have with this is we have had countless survivors, also hostages and the families of, of hostages, you know, that they came to London, they, they testified. It's difficult because you're asking people who have survived incredible trauma to relieve it again and again, every time that they tell the story. And I think that is something that is for me personally, because I'm a mother, I find this incredibly difficult because I don't want, when you know what they've been through, when you know what the loved one have been through. You know, as a human being, as a mom, for me to be asking those people who survived, I mean, horrors that I can't even describe in words, to ask them to relieve it again because people want to be told when they've been told a hundred times so that maybe they would believe us. I feel, you know, it's, it's difficult, it's painful. And I'm thinking... Do I really want to, you know, turn this into a circus? Because is enough care given to these people in the sense that do people appreciate, you know, the um, the difficulty of telling, you know, that story, that particular story that is very fresh in their mind? I mean, you need to remember it's just a year ago. It's nothing, you know, in terms of, you know, psychologically, the trauma is very real. It's very much in the present for them. So it's a difficult exercise. And a lot of people tend to, you know, to to call this an exercise in propaganda. They tend to to run away from it. They don't want to listen because they already decided that Jews are guilty. And so they don't want to hear about Jews being the victims. And I think there's a difference in between someone being the victim of a crime and that person being a victim. There's a whole universe between those two words. Someone was done wrong. Somebody suffered, you know, an injustice. So that person is a victim by definition, but it doesn't mean that that person has to exist as a victim. That person could just testify to what happened and just, you know, share. This is my story. This is what happened to me. And I demand justice. But it doesn't mean that this person is, is doing a boohoo moment, you know, asking for people to, to pity them. That's not what justice is about. And I think that today there's a conflation of the two where people think that victimization is there for show. I don't think that's what is going on with the, the victims of October 7th. And I would like people to understand that. Is the BBC a problem when it comes to Israel? Good Lord, the BBC. Where do I start with the BBC? Yeah. Look, I think that clearly there's something, you know, they will disagree with me. But I think there is something to be said about an organization that claims to hold to objectivity and integrity by not calling things what they are truly is like, you know, they're skirting around the issue. So they, they don't want to call a table a table. They will describe the table, but they will not tell you that it's a table. And this is what they're doing with Hamas. You know, they're painting them as this militant group or when they talk, for example, about the Gaza health ministry, it's Hamas that we're talking about. It's a proscribed terrorist organization under UK law. And so the question is to be asked as to why is it that they feel the need to erase that reality? from their reporting. 
you can't call, you know, if it's as if someone was going to walk around and said that, you know, Al-Qaeda was not a terrorist organization or that ISIS wasn't a terrorist organization. They were. Those, you know, the words matter very much so because they mean something. And when you speak those words, you convey a certain reality to your public. And by refusing to do that, you're lying to people. And then it's an exercise in misinformation and disinformation. Now, the other question that people need to ask themselves is who is that serving? Is it serving the, the British public to be misled, to believe that Hamas is actually a legitimate government rather than actually call them by their name under British law that it's a terrorist organization? And so mm. that's why I have a problem with the BBC. And we're trying, again, we're not in the business of criminalizing people or speech. What we're trying to convey, again, is that there's a need to reform. There's a need to address an issue that goes for it's, it's so much more than just words it's about a narrative it's about painting a story it's about robbing people from a context that would be needed for them to be making the right choices for themselves and again if people choose to support Hamas by the end of it once they you know they told the truth then that's okay that it's on them but to lie to the British public by not giving them all the information for me is so misleading it's a crime because I believe that it's touching you know at the integrity of a person you're robbing that person from being enlightened. You're forcing that person to abide by rules that it did not sign up to, that it doesn't understand because context was never needed. It's like it's asking someone to sign a contract, you know, with their eyes closed without reading anything. You can't do that. It's a fraud. And I feel this is what they're doing. And they're making people complicit in supporting terrorist organizations that wish them harm, by the way. And so that, for me, it's a great injustice and something needs to be done. Why do you do what you do? Why do I do what I do? Because I'm a Jew and I've I've lived in the Middle East. I was married to a Muslim man and I've suffered anti-Semitism to level I don't want to get into. But I've seen what it does to a person because I lived it. It's soul destroyer. It's, it eats at you because someone is asking you to erase your very DNA, what makes you you, your very identity and your heritage. And I swore to myself that I would fight it with everything that I have. And because I'm a mother, I have a duty to also make sure that I leave my children a world that is better than the one I found. It's quite simple. It's uh, maybe naive, but here you go. What is your hope and your prayer for the future of the organization? I hope that we'll make new friends, build bridges with people outside our community, because I believe that we believe in Israel needs to be a reflection of Israel and that it's all inclusive. I want people to feel that they have a home. I want to defend people's voice. I want to speak for justice. I want to make the world a better place. I want to do a great many things. But I want to give people who have been unspoken a voice. I want them to feel heard. I want them to feel seen. And I want to be able to challenge myself to walk a mile in their shoes and to try to understand their perspective and how we could work together. Because I don't believe, look, I believe in conflict in the sense that it's inevitable. But I also believe that we can lead from a place of love and compassion and not fear. Because fear leads to, to evil and leads to bad decisions and violence and all those things that we don't want and we don't need because it's not, not helping us build anything together. And we have to live in this planet together. And so I want to find a better way. There is a better way. And it's not easy because it's, it's, it's the harder way. Because it means talking to people. It means challenging yourself and actually considering the fact that maybe you're wrong and how can you make it better for the other person? How can you find a compromise? And that means that you're going to have to give up something. You're going to have to sacrifice a little bit to give the other person the desire to do the same and then find some common ground and build together. Because look, we all, we are people. My rights are no greater than yours. You have rights, so do I. How do we exist together and create a space where both our rights are respected in a way that works? And, you know, that means having ongoing conversations because the world is a, is a living place. It's moving. It's alive. And so it moves. And so do we. And so we have to mm. continue those conversations. And it's not easy, but, you know, what else are we going to do? Kill each other? What's your website for people who'd like to know more about the work that you do? Well, they can visit webelieveinisrael.org.uk. They can reach out to us. There's uh, a contact us. We're actually in the process of redoing, revamping our website. So we're almost done. So uh, bear with us. It's not it's not all done. So if you find a few mistakes in that, not everything is, is properly aligned and that we don't have, you know, some fonts are still kind of uh, here and there and everywhere. It should be done in about a week time. We're working really hard to create new outputs. We're going to... 
We're going to create a, a podcast. We're going to create a blog. We're going to be launching some new campaigns and we're going to be reaching out to many communities and offer them a voice in our blog and our podcast. We want to hear from people. We want to engage in a dialogue that is so much needed. And again, we're not interested in confrontation. We want people to feel that they could talk to us and us to them so that, you know, we could get to know each other, understand all realities, what is the perception that we have of reality and find a way forward. Well, Catherine, thank you very much for sharing today. My pleasure.